Good evening. My name is Lily and I'm a final year PhD student in the School of Optometry and Vision Science. I'm also a qualified optometrist and my experience as an optometrist inspired me into doing my PhD project. There's a clinical and molecular component to my project, but for today's presentation, I'll be focusing on the clinical aspect. Now to begin with, I'd like to enlighten you with a little story. In 1901, a German physician, Dr. Alois Alzheimer, encountered a woman with a strange mental illness. She had memory loss, language problems, and strange behavioral symptoms. This woman's disease soon became Dr. Alzheimer's obsession over the coming years. In 1906, the woman died and her brain was sent away for post-mortem histological analysis. And these abnormal proteins were found adjacent to the cells in the brain. These proteins were the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles as illustrated in this diagram. And this is just a normal healthy brain for comparison. To this day, these proteins are still the defining signs of Alzheimer's disease. Now more than a century has passed, and I have both good news and bad news to share. The bad news is, the clinical diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease hasn't changed all that much. Although nowadays we have the luxury of technology such as MRI and cerebral spinal fluid analysis, they are both highly invasive and very expensive. So the clinical diagnosis relies heavily on patient symptoms, meaning that the disease is often only diagnosed when significant damage in the brain has already occurred. And perhaps this is why therapeutic intervention hasn't been all that successful. The brain had simply lost its reserve to regain function. But don't be disheartened. The good news is there are many researchers out there working diligently on the topic to understand the disease process and to achieve better diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Leading us to my PhD topic, window to the central nervous system, retinal examination for the early diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease. And my aims are firstly to determine whether there are clinical ocular signs and symptoms specific in Alzheimer's patients. And secondly, to design an eye examination for the early detection of the disease. Now, this may be a funny idea, strange idea to you, but in fact, complaints related to vision are actually among some of the earlier symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. Visual function testing has revealed a deficit in contrast sensitivity, visual field defect, color vision abnormality, etc. The sensory structure of the eye is the retina, which is a multi-layered structure lining the back inner surface of the eyeball. And the innermost layer of the retina forms the optic nerve, which makes direct connection to the brain. Now, because of this anatomical connection and close embryological origin between the eyes and the brain, it makes you wonder whether the eyes may act as window to neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, data from my animal studies and from the literature both confirm that there are Alzheimer's associated proteins accumulating in the retina. This is an image taken from my thesis, and here we can see that the abnormal protein are colored in green, and they are lying right at, um, they are lying adjacent to the retinal cells, colored in blue. And these proteins are believed to lead to inflammation, degeneration, and retinal thinning, which clinicians can detect. Now, Hinton's group in 1986 was actually one of the first to detect um, degeneration at the level of the retina in Alzheimer's disease. This is a post-mortem image of the retina in the cross section at approximately the level of the red line. And here we can see in the control tissue that the cells are nicely packed. Whereas in the Alzheimer's samples, the cells are looking more sparse and spread out, suggesting cellular loss and retinal thinning. Now more recently, clinicians are able to detect retinal thinning by means of non-invasive imaging techniques such as the optical coherence tomography, or OCT for short, which I will explain in a moment. And this leads us to my PhD hypothesis that there are structural and functional changes in the retina of Alzheimer's patients detectable through non-invasive eye testing. To investigate my hypothesis, 
A clinical pilot study was designed to include 20 young controls, 20 elderly controls, and 20 cases of confirmed Alzheimer's disease. During participant recruitment, um, individuals with known eye diseases or neurological conditions other than Alzheimer's disease were excluded. People who fulfilled the inclusion criteria underwent a cognitive assessment as part of the baseline measures. Each participant then underwent a thorough eye examination, including the quantitative analysis of the retinal anatomy and retinal function. Now, firstly, retinal anatomy was assessed by OCT, which was mentioned earlier. The, the principle of the OCT is similar to an ultrasound, which gives you the morphology and thickness profile of the retina. And interestingly, in Alzheimer's disease, the retina is significantly thinned compared to the controls. Next, I decided to look at the retinal function just to see whether the abnormal retinal thinning was causing any functional problems. And this was firstly done by the visual field test, which is the gold standard for assessing retinal function. The participant was instructed to focus on the central fixation cross and to press a button on the clicker whenever a stimulus such as this one is seen. And this is just to demonstrate to you that the stimuli can be anywhere in the field and they vary in intensity. Now the visual field index, which is essentially a percentage score of the overall sensitivity of the retina, is plotted here. And in the Alzheimer's group, the visual field index was again significantly reduced. Now, although the visual field test is the gold standard, I've noticed some disadvantages during my data collection. For instance, it requires very good attention from the patient. And I've noticed that in my elderly patients, a lot of them were showing signs of inattention, such as wandering of their eyes or closing of their eyes, making the results unreliable. Now, a less common but potentially more reliable method of measuring retinal function is the electroretinogram, or ERG for short. During ERG uh, measurement, the electrodes that are attached to the participant's eyes are measuring the response from the retina as the participant focuses on the checkerboard stimulus, such as this one. And simultaneously, the waveforms are displayed on a separate screen. And this required no cognitive input from the patient. One important parameter to look at here is the amplitude of the electroretinogram, which tells us how strongly the retina is responding to the stimulus. And here we can see that the amplitude of the ERG is again um, significantly reduced in the Alzheimer's group compared to the control groups. But what does this all mean? Well, hopefully in my presentation, I have demonstrated to you that in the process of testing whether changes in the eyes is an effective way of setting Alzheimer's patients apart from the controls, I have explored the use of OCT for retinal anatomy, the use of the visual field and electroretinogram for the assessment of retinal function. And I can conclude that there was a significant reduction in retinal thickness that is correlated with a significant reduction in retinal function. My clinical pilot study has already given me insight for future research involving a larger cohort of study population. For instance, when it comes to testing the retinal function, the ERG proved to be a more feasible and reliable way of testing retinal function than the visual field, particularly in the cognitively impaired. I would also like to investigate further whether retinal examination is sufficiently sensitive and specific when it comes to the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Although it's still early days, I like to think that in the near future, the retina can really become the window to, to the central nervous system. And if Dr. Alzheimer was here with us tonight, I hope he appreciates the fact that we are looking outside the brain for the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors in the School of Optometry, my advisors from the Center for Brain Research, and um, our collaborators in Chile, our funding sources, and last but not the least, all of my lovely participants. Thank you. Hi. How, how young do you think you could um, do this sort of test and pick up Alzheimer's disease? 
Okay, so um, maybe I'll just paraphrase your question just to be sure that I understood it right. So you're wondering whether um, how young the participants will have to be for me to detect a cognitive impairment. Okay, so um, in the normal population, there's usually a slight cognitive decline. Um, the age of 65 is usually the cutoff. So um, I'm expecting that um, if the disease is due to Alzheimer's disease, um, there are two general types, the early onset and the late onset. So I don't think age is a, um, a fair um, parameter per se to look at. Um, it'll be due to the actual pathophysiology of the disease. But um, the, the protocol I'm describing here, I, I think I will be able to um, detect Alzheimer's disease despite of the age, but um, more related to the severity of cognitive impairment. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if are there other um, illnesses or things that are diagnosed through eye testing where the eye is the window to the brain in a similar okay. way or is this really new? Um, for, for cognitive impairment it is a novel method but for things like um, for diseases such as um, stroke so um, if the stroke is affecting certain parts of the visual pathway, then the visual field test will actually show a um, quite a distinctive pattern and it'll show you um, which part of the brain the stroke happened. So um, it has been explored in the past for other neurological conditions, but um, not for neurodegenerative diseases without any other causes. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm glad you paid attention to the number of samples I have. <laughs> so um, ideally, in the ideal world, I was um, hoping to um, have equal numbers of participants for all of my three, um, or the, the young control, elderly control, and Alzheimer's cases. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, some of the participants I've recruited, I've had to exclude, hence um, the small sample size for particularly the Alzheimer's group. And um, I've actually um, had to exclude some people because um, incidentally we found um, they didn't have Alzheimer's disease, but they had different types of dementia. So um, for now, I, I would say that it's probably um, in the ideal world, I'd like to recruit more participants. And um, Although I'm in the final few months of my PhD, I am still diligently recruiting for participants just to make my results more robust. So hopefully um, that'll happen. So have you done any statistical sort of uh, modulation? Oh yes, so um, of the limited samples I have, I have done the one-way ANOVA um, just to see whether there's a um, significant difference between the groups. Yeah, so that, that was the method I used although the sample sizes were uneven. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, hello. <laughs> I understood. Oh, yeah, when, you're, when you're doing something statistical, then mm. uh, most of the time, all the points, all the like uh, targets are uh, coming along the model, the, the model line. But uh, if the model is not working properly, then the the, the test points are uh, they just go go anywhere. They can just right. Uh, Right. Okay. So, so I guess I guess your your um, if I paraphrase your question, if the 
um, most of my um, data are normally distributed. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, any clinical data um, are very variable. And um, take a very simple measurement, for example, the intraocular pressure, which everyone would have um, had done if you've been to an optometrist, that actually doesn't follow a normal distribution either. So for that purpose, I've actually run um, parametric and non-parametric statistical analysis just to see whether um, the different analysis makes a difference to um, my statistical significance values. And they do for the, for the samples I have analyzed. Yeah, but I, I do hope um, that a larger sample size will give me even more robustness in my um, statistical analysis. Yeah, thank you. Very much. Thank you.